In this lecture, we're going to investigate the process of photosynthesis. And uh, we begin that investigation by recalling how photosynthesis interacts with our planet. So again, photosynthesis is the thing that takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and makes it more readily accessed by uh, other organisms and features of our planet. Okay, so a little bit about what's going on here. This is a nice little summary. Uh, basically, energy from the sun comes down and carbon dioxide is taken out of the air. Water is consumed and then we're left with two very, very important products. One, oxygen and uh, sugars. So between the two of these, life can be sustained. And so what a great partnership it is that our waste product is carbon dioxide, but that's a vital nutrient to plants. Uh, plants' waste product is oxygen, but that's a vital nutrient for us. So it's a really great partnership that um, we have with plants. We would call that a symbiotic relationship because both members us and plants are benefited by each other's existence. Just a really cool um, story there in the natural world. Okay, a little bit about the chemical equation for photosynthesis. You could summarize it as the following. One, there's going to be a set of reactants. The reactants that are used are six molecules of water to six molecules of CO2. Add a little energy in the form of sunlight and what you will end up with is six molecules of oxygen and a molecule of sugar. In particular, this is uh, glucose. This reaction is happening all of the time uh, in plants to create many, 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 many molecules of glucose. Then other living things will consume those molecules of glucose and then effectively what has happened when, uh, for example, we eat uh, a plant, the sugars in that plant bear the carbon that originally came from the atmosphere and then we consume them and it becomes assimilated or part of our bodies. Um, in the process most of this carbon and oxygen is going to be um, breathed out but some of it sticks around to form the composition of our bodies. Okay now there are two parts to the chemical equation there's a light dependent reaction and there's a light independent reaction. So the light dependent reaction, as the name suggests, it can only occur when light is present. The light independent reaction is sometimes known as the dark reaction, though this is a misnomer because this reaction can happen if it's light or dark. Now the things that are made from these two halves of photosynthesis, the light dependent reaction, the way I like to think about this is that it's accumulating all of the building materials that are gonna be required to build a sugar molecule. So ATP is built. Remember ATP is an energy molecule that stores energy. And then electrons are accumulated. And it's going to be the electrons. And it's the electrons that are going to be required to what's known as, and this is a little beyond the scope of our class, reduce uh, carbon dioxide. So anytime you're adding electrons to a molecule, you're in a way adding a little bit more energy to it. And when you add electrons, it's called reducing the molecule versus taking away electrons would be uh, oxidizing the molecule. Usually when we're reducing, it's going towards building something and we're oxidizing, it's generally a process that breaks things down. Um, the light independent reaction then, it's the main outcome is that it makes sugar. So we're building the building, making the building blocks and the light dependent sending those over to the light independent to then be made as a sugar molecule. Now where is this all occurring? This occurs in an organelle called chloroplast uh, found in photosynthetic organisms inside of their cells. So an example of this in a tree would be something like the following. If we were to take a snapshot of the leaf and look at its cross section, there's the upper part of the leaf and there's the lower part of the leaf and then there's a whole bunch of cells in the middle. Also an interesting feature here is that there's a little gateway, a little hole that allows carbon dioxide and oxygen into and out of the cell. 
Uh, there's a lot of gas exchange happening here in this process, photosynthesis. So this is what one of those gateways would look like, uh, a very little small microscopic hole to allow uh, gas into and out of the leaf. All right, well, if we would look at specifically some of these cells in the middle layer, the mesophyll, as it were, they would look something like this. They have a uh, nucleus, a big vacuole. Again, vacuoles are a place where they can store nutrients. It also is a place to store water to kind of give the cell its rigidity or its shape, give the, help the plant stay uh, upright in things. All right, well, in plant cells, there are chloroplasts. And if we were to look at a chloroplast really magnified, what we'd find is that there's an outer shell to it. So you can kind of see that here. It's like this outer shell. It looks a little almost like a disc. And inside of there, there are these stacks of little pancakes. And little pancakes are called thylakoids. This whole stack is called a granum, or a grana for plural. But there are these little stacks called thylakoids. It's in the membrane of the thylakoid that the light reaction takes place. And sorry, by light reaction, I mean the light uh, dependent reaction. All right, and then it's the, what's known as the stroma is the fluid that's inside the chloroplast, but it's outside of the, the pancakes, the thylakoids. The stroma is the place where the light uh, independent reaction takes place. So that's what we're going to be talking about for reference sake. Um, this is where the action is going on here inside of the chloroplast of plant cells. All right, let's turn our attention to the light dependent reaction. Before we, we get too far, though, we have to have a little discussion here about what light even is. And that will get us to what's known as the electromagnetic spectrum. So electromagnetic energy is a very curious thing. People don't really know if it's a wave or if it's a particle. It's kind of both at the same time, which sounds very bizarre. And the waves have a wavelength between them. And so as you can think about like if there was uh, this energy that was oscillating like this throughout the universe, the distance between these waves would be considered the wavelength. It's the wavelength that determines how much energy it has. Some things with a very uh, big wavelength, I guess I could say a long wavelength, are usually less, they carry usually less energy and things with a short wavelength generally considered, uh, are considered to have more energy. And this is because they, the waves come crashing on the substance many more times at a higher frequency when the wavelengths are short, whereas if the wavelengths are really, 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 really long, it's like, it's like think about it being like waves of the ocean with a really, really big delay between when they crash upon the shore. It's less energy being brought to the shore, whereas if there's a lot of waves one after the next, it's more energy being brought to the shore. Okay, here's what the electromagnetic spectrum looks like. It's um, arranged in according to the lengths of the waves. So here we were seeing wavelengths could be as many as uh, many kilometers long. Um, or on the scale of meters. And when we talk about radio waves, like when you're driving in your car and you have an antenna, what's happening is that the radio waves, it's electromagnetic energy, the exact same stuff as light, um, just a longer wavelength. And so that, that, that radio wave is gonna hit your antenna and it's gonna cause electrons to flow through the antenna and then that will get picked up on your radio as sound. Okay, that scale is anywhere between a meter and 100 meters to even kilometers long. Uh, the visible light that we perceive is 
usually on the scale of nanometers. Just for reference sake, like if you had a centimeter, you know, most of us have a, a, an idea of how long a centimeter is. It's about like the width of your fingernail. Um, and you, di you divided that, that centimeter into 10 million parts. One of those 10 million parts would be the distance of a nanometer. Okay, so it's a very, very small wavelength. And the, of that spectrum, the red waves of length are the longest, so they have the, the least amount of energy. And the, then the greatest wavelength would be more on the blue uh, spectrum. This is why, like, alarm clocks often have red lights, because it's a little less energy. It's a little less uh, startling to the eye, whereas if it's a blue light, it's a little bit brighter and a little bit uh, more jarring in a low light condition. Okay, and then if we keep going on, this is on the same spectrum as UV, so the stuff that gives you a sunburn. Um, X-rays, the things that would pass through your body to give you a, an idea of what your bones look like. And then uh, gamma rays would be some of the strongest uh, radiation that's possible. Okay, so it's very interesting, I think, that this curious thing, light, is of the same substance and nature as a whole bunch of other stuff, and it just varies the properties of the stuff vary depending on the wavelength. Very, very mysterious thing. All right, so that's light, and um, light is captured by these molecules known as pigments. So pigment is just an interesting type of molecule that has a certain shape to it that allows it to capture uh, the energy that is stored in an electromagnetic wave. There are a couple different types of pigments that we find in leaves, and they all will uh, capture light of a certain wavelength. So here we're actually seeing the different wavelengths. So this is wavelength across the, the x-axis here. The different wavelengths that are captured by each pigment is somewhat shown here. So for example, chlorophyll, there's a couple different types, but chlorophyll B, for example, will capture light in the blue range. So that's why it, the peak absorption here is in this spectrum of nanometers, which corresponds to blue light. It also captures um, um, orange and red light. Okay. Chlorophyll A does about the same thing. It captures a little bit more of the lower wavelength of, of blue, so more closer, closer to the UV light, and then it also um, the red and orange light. Now what's interesting is because these absorb, because chlorophyll, for example, absorbs between the blue light and the yellow and orange light, you can see that the one light that it doesn't absorb is green. And because of that, guess what? It reflects this color. So we actually, um, we actually see leaves as being green, not because they're green, but kind of in a way because they're the absent, absence of green. The green light is reflected off and not absorbed, and that's why we see it. Okay, so Another interesting component of this is that chlorophyll or, or different pigments are sturdier than others. So when the temperatures start to drop, um, some will be basically descent, some will degrade faster than the others. And this is why we get fall colors in the fall season because those pigments that um, absorb this light in the orange and green, or sorry, the yellow and orange spectrum, those pigments that absorb that light die off quicker so that then the light is no longer absorbed and it instead is reflected. Okay, uh, a photosystem then is a molecule, or it's like a, it's like a complex of molecules in which pigments are found in high concentration. So here's an example. This sh is showing the plasma membrane with our phospholipid bilayer. Here is a photosystem, so it's like a protein, and then inside of that are all of these pigments, so individual pigment molecules specifically in here. Um, we're seeing chlorophyll. And what happens in a photocenter is light energy is going to strike it. It's going to become concentrated, and what happens is that electrons start getting excited kind of in the same way that um, a radio wave would hit your antenna and cause the antenna to 
to send electrons down the antenna and you'd be able your car can circuitry can pick up that flow of electrons in the same way the the energy stored here strikes these molecules and causes electrons to start flowing they all get the energy from that flow of electrons gets concentrated on one spot and as soon as the energy is great enough great enough great enough <clears throat> outshoots an electron and that's going to be really important we'll talk about that in just a minute okay but the long and short of it is a photosystem is a place where there are a lot of pigments so that the light energy we can give you so that light energy can be captured um, in a strong way such that electrons will flow and eventually get constant and eventually the energy will be so concentrated that it ejects an electron okay um, the process looks something like this for the light dependent reaction keep in mind light dependent reaction the one requiring light happens in the thylakoid so imagine this being a thylakoid membrane what I'm drawing here there are in that membrane basically four import, important regions that make this whole process go one there is a photosystem then there is a complex of proteins known as an electron transport chain then there is another photosystem and then there is another complex of proteins which are also called an electron transport chain so four things you've got photosystem a thing that shuttles electrons across to another photosystem a thing that shuttles electrons across and then lastly we have this which is called the ATP synthase protein all right now the first one here is called and this is a little bit confusing this is called photosystem 2 because it was discovered second but it actually is first in the sequence of things and then this one here is called photosystem 1 okay all right so here's how, what happens light it all starts with light so maybe I'll get a nice little yellow color here we've got light coming down striking this membrane and what's going to happen is that water that's inside of the membrane gets split by that light in a process known as photolysis which means light splitting okay so this gets split into hydrogen ions two of them and then uh, oxygen now in the process the uh, electrons get put into this photosystem so this photosystem what it does again it's the place where there's pigments that concentrate energy and then eventually eject out an electron an electrons got a negative charge so there has to be a way to replenish the electrons that are continually being ejected out of this because of the influence of light and so that's where water comes into play and that is why plants need water is that that water is going to be a nice constant supply of electrons to make this whole thing happen okay then what happens is the electron just because of the sheer chemistry of things the electron is going to want to bounce around and get shuttled across these different proteins that are in the um, membrane until it eventually makes its way to photosystem one then light also strikes photosystem one same deal as photosystem two it excites the photosystem all the pigments inside of it until they get so riled up that they eventually eject out the electron again And then the electron is going to do this kind of the same thing. It's going to travel, 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 travel across. 
And then what happens is it comes up to this special protein, which is going to load it up onto what I call the electron taxi. Here we go. Here's our electron taxi. This electron taxi is called N A D P plus is the molecule. It's a molecule of NADP. It's got a positive charge to it. Okay, what happens is that that electron gets shuttled onto there. And when that happens, and I guess I should this I should um I should say that this is a combination of things here. This is NAD P plus plus H plus. So two things that both have a positive charge. Okay, when the electrons come to the taxi, the taxi's got two spots for it. Okay, so think about there being a back seat where two electrons can ride. Once the electrons jump onto the taxi, okay, so here we go, we'll put, here's one electron has made it, and then shortly thereafter another electron has made it. So there they are in the back seat. Then this is no longer called NADP plus plus H plus. This thing is called NADPH. Because what happens is one of the electrons goes to this molecule, one of the electrons goes to this molecule, and then these two things come together. Uh, so uh, they form one NADPH that has no positive or negative charge. You know, the two negative charged electrons come up with the two positive charged substances here. They form one nice happy molecule. So that is what we would call the taxi when it's full of electrons. So if you see this big, scary, long molecule name, NADPH, uh, just bear in mind that all it is is an electron shuttle. Okay. Oops. This is an electron shuttle. And it's going to take those electrons and bring them to somewhere very special. All right. Now, in this whole process, one of the reasons for this, we'll, we'll figure out later, you know, we want the electrons to be used to reduce carbon dioxide later to make sugar. So this is going to go bye-bye for now. But in the meantime, a very super important thing that happens is that the hydrogen ions that have come from water and are now you know, accumulating in here as water keeps getting broken down and broken down and broken down and broken down and broken down. Oh, by the way, what happens to the oxygen is that it reacts with other oxygens from the water molecule. Okay, so you've got all these oxygens and you've got hydrogen ions. The two oxygens come together to form uh, O2, and then O2 is a gas, so it escapes. That's where we get the air that we breathe, right here, from the splitting of water. Okay, so now what happens to the hydrogens is that hydrogens have a positive charge. You know, a hydrogen atom is really all, a very simple atom. It has one proton, one electron, no neutrons. So when you split an atom of hydrogen, you're just splitting the electron off. And then now you've got two, the two subatomic particles, basically. The proton, that's another way you could think of a hydrogen ion, is just a, simply a proton, a positively charged proton and the negatively charged electron. And as these protons are attracted to the electrons, they somewhat get tricked and they end up accumulating inside of the thylakoid. So this is that pancake thing, that little stacks of pancake. Now we're inside of it. So out here, this would be the stroma, the region that's still inside the chloroplast, but not in, technically inside of the little pancake, the thylakoid. So what happens then is you have these protons accumulating inside of the thylakoid. It's like a little sack of hydrogen ions. And as they accumulate, they start to form a concentration gradient because they're accumulating in here, but they're disappearing from here because this is where they came from. So you can see that this is a, an active process, right, because we have after this has been going some time, we have a low concentration of hydrogens inside the cell and a higher concentration building inside the thylakoid. So this is going up a concentration gradient. It doesn't naturally want to go from a low concentration to a high concentration, but 
because of the electrical charge and the, the draw of that charge of an electron, um, it can force the hydrogen to go in a way that it wouldn't normally otherwise go and go from low concentration to high concentration. So this is what we call establishing the proton gradient. All right. It is establishing the proton gradient which is paramount. This is what drives the production of ATP. And this is going to also be a very similar process that happens um, in our cells to make energy as well. It just happens a little differently in plants. Okay, so once all of these hydrogens are accumulating and there's this big gradient inside the thylakoid, a high concentration of hydrogen ions inside the thylakoid and not as many outside, if given the chance in a door were to open, all of these hydrogen ions would want to rush outside of the thylakoid. And that's exactly what happens. There is a door here, which is called the ATP synthase protein. As soon as it opens, hydrogens flow through it. And as they flow through it, they actually, you can kind of think about it being like a, like a turnstile. Like if you've ever been to the, you know, if you go to like the state fair or into some building where you have that little spinny thing that you have to pass through and it somewhat counts how many people are coming in and out. Well, that's a similar thing here, or you can think about it being like a turbine or something. So you've got this little, this little rotor. I'll just draw it kind of like a little turbine thing. And as the hydrogens flow through there, it spins this rotor, this turbine. As the turbine spins, powers the mechanism required to take um, required to make ATP. We'll just say it this way. ATP is made when two things are put together. So the two things are ADP and then P. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate. So um, it's just adenosine triphosphate has three phosphate groups on it. Adenosine diphosphate has two phosphate groups on it, and it's when you stick the third one on that a lot of energy is stored onto the molecule. So when you take one phosphate and you put it onto the molecule that's got two phosphates already, you end up with three phosphates, ATP. And that is what makes ATP, is the flow of the hydrogen ions through that uh, protein. And they flow and they flow and they flow and they flow because there's more, much more of them inside the thylakoid than outside. They're flowing down a concentration gradient. So at the end of the day, ATP and NADPH are made. This is kind of, if you don't understand, if you can't like, you know, speak your way all throughout this whole complex process, at the end of the day, what's important to know is that ATP and NADPH are made. What is this stuff? Remember, anytime you see this, just think of it as being electrons being shuttled on a molecule. So ATP and electrons are made. That's the summary. Okay, the light independent reaction then, uh, this is occurring in the stroma, so this region of the chloroplast that's not inside the little pancakes, the thylakoids. And what happens here is that we, here's our ATP and NADPH that were just made from the light dependent reaction. Those get brought over to the stroma where there's a whole bunch of biochemical uh, reactions happening. And in essence, CO2, is going to, going to be present and it's going to be attached to a five carbon molecule. Okay, so this CO2 is a one carbon molecule, it just has one atom of carbon. This other molecule called ribulose bisphosphate, this is going to be a five carbon molecule. And so at the end of the day, if you take one carbon and you add it to five carbons, you get a six carbon molecule. And herein lies the first step of what's known the, as the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is, is somewhat synonymous with what we mean when we say the light independent reaction. It is the Calvin cycle, this cyclical reaction that continues to churn and churn and churn and churn. So the first phase would be fixation. You have one carbon molecule, CO2, adding added to a five carbon molecule to create a six carbon molecule. The next step then is uh, what's known as reduction. So this six carbon molecule that we've just made 
splits apart into two, three uh, carbon molecules, and specifically the name of those is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Um, these are the molecules that are going to be the precursors that can be used to build glucose. So two of these linked together will form glucose. But there's a little bit of an interesting uh, perplexity here because it's uh, you might you know you might be wondering well why do we make a six carbon molecule just to you know break it in half? That seems kind of productive. Make it just to break it in half. Why didn't you just keep it in half in the first place? And the answer is that it, it takes several turns of this to make. Um, two of these that can then be expended to make a sugar molecule. So we're making two of them. Uh, one of them will leave, and then the whole cycle will begin again, and then another one will leave, and then the whole cycle will leave, go again, and then another one will leave. And always one stays behind, because that is going to have to then be what's known as regenerated. So you get one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate leaving, and then the other one sticking around to be regenerated back into uh, our five carbon molecule that we started with so that the whole cycle can begin again. In the process, the, the big energy step here is this reduction part. Getting the, getting the, the molecule to change its shape and then split apart so that it can yield a G3P or two G3Ps, one that can be used to make glucose, the other that can be regenerated. So you can see that here we've got you know, elect, uh, energy and electrons coming from the light dependent reaction. And then after this step, you have the empty electron shuttle and then the energy depleted molecule returning back to the thylakoid so that it can pick up more electrons, be converted into more energy so then that can continue to dump and fuel this whole biochemical cycle. At the end of the day, if you knew that there are three phases, fixation, reduction, and regeneration, and that in fixation you have a one carbon and a five carbon, making a six carbon. Reduction, you have that six carbon split it into two, three carbons. Regeneration, that one of those three carbons is brought back to our starting point. That's all you really have to know here for this. We'll finish up with a great figure here that summarizes the whole process. This is a figure that will likely be on the exam, so you'll want to know your way inside and out of this figure. And let me just describe it to you here. So on the left hand side we have a dependent reaction, light dependent, and on the other side we have the light independent reaction. Okay, the summary then is that in the light dependent reaction there is water being consumed and oxygen produced. The reason again is that water is split through a process known as photolysis, photolysis, and um, oxygen is going to be uh, expelled as a waste product that we can then use. The hydrogens are going to be split so the electrons strip from the proton and then they they go down the electron transport chain and then the protons go get pumped into a gradient which powers the ATP synthase. At the end of the day, it's important to know is that these two items are made here. We have energy made and we have electrons accumulated. Those energy and those electrons are going to be shuttled to the stroma where they then will fuel the Kelvin cycle, which ultimately is going to take carbon dioxide out of the air, and it's going to churn out this molecule called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is the precursor, the building block, that can be put together to make glucose. All right, then these things here, once the energy is depleted, it turns into um, back into ADP plus P. PI stands for inorganic phosphate, a phosphate that's not attached to anything. So you've got a two phosphate molecule and a one little phosphate then then have to be put back together to make ATP. And then here we have our empty um, electron taxi, our little ele empty electron shuttle coming back to pick up more electrons. 
and now we can see where all these variables come into play. The, the reason why CO2 is required, well, that goes in here to drive the Kelvin cycle as a source of carbon that can be uh, employed or utilized to make sugar molecules. The water is required because it's split through photolysis to uh, send electrons through the electron transport chain. Oxygen is produced because it's one of the waste products from after water has been split. And then lastly, the sugar that is made is glucose. There you have it. Photosynthesis and a nice, concise little figure. Um, if you want, this is a little bit more detail, but it's it gives a little bit better, accurate illustration of the whole process. So I invite you to watch this if you like. They go into more detail than you'll be expected to know. But if you're curious, have at it. In order for plants to grow, they need inputs of carbon dioxide, water, and energy. The chemical process by which plants use these resources to manufacture glucose, the building blocks of plants, is called photosynthesis. In the process, oxygen gas is produced as a byproduct. The energy for photosynthesis originates in the sun and arrives at the earth as sunlight. This light has both a wave and a particle nature. The particles, or photons, are the smallest units of light. Photons oscillate along a path, which is measured as wavelengths. The light emitted from the sun contains photons in a wide spectrum of wavelengths, called the electromagnetic spectrum. Photosynthetic organisms use only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, called visible light. Photosynthetic organisms contain pigments that facilitate the capture of wavelengths of light in the visible light range. The color of the pigment comes from the wavelengths of light reflected. Plants appear green because they reflect yellow and green wavelengths of light. Red and blue wavelengths of light are absorbed by these pigments and provide the energy that is used for photosynthesis. Within eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms, also known as photoautotrophs, the chemical reactions of photosynthesis occur within plant cells in specialized structures known as chloroplasts. Photosynthesis consists of two sets of reactions, the light-dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. Within the chloroplast are small disc-like structures called thylakoids, which are surrounded by a fluid-filled space called the stroma. The reactions that synthesize glucose, the Calvin cycle, occur in the stroma. The light-dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid. It is here that conversion of light energy to chemical energy is initiated. In most photosynthetic organisms, thylakoids contain pairs of photosystems, called photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, that work in tandem to produce the energy that will later be used in the stroma to manufacture sugars. The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment molecules and chlorophyll, the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecules, the absorbed light energy excites electrons to a higher state. Photosystems will channel the excitation energy gathered by the pigment molecules to a reaction center chlorophyll molecule, which will then pass the electrons to a series of proteins located on the thylakoid membrane. Photons of light strike photosystems 1 and 2 simultaneously. We will examine what happens with the photons striking photosystem 2 first. The energized electrons are passed from the reaction center of photosystem 2 to an electron transport chain. The electrons lost by photosystem 2 are replaced by a process called photolysis, which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While this oxygen gas is a byproduct of photosynthesis, it is an important input to the cellular respiration pathways. As electrons pass through the electron transport chain, the energy from the electron is used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma to the thylakoid.
creating a concentration gradient. This gradient powers a protein called ATP synthase, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. The low energy electrons leaving photosystem 2 are shuttled to photosystem 1. Within photosystem 1, low energy electrons are re-energized and are passed through an electron transport chain where they are used to reduce the electron carrier NADP plus to NADPH. When the chloroplast is receiving a steady supply of photons, NADPH and ATP molecules are rapidly being provided to the metabolic pathways in the stroma. Therefore, the ATP and NADPH formed during the light-dependent reactions are used in the stroma to fuel the Calvin cycle reactions. The Calvin cycle consists of a series of reactions that reduce carbon dioxide to produce the carbohydrate glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The cycle consists of three steps, the first of which is carbon fixation. In this step, carbon dioxide is attached to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, resulting in a 6-carbon molecule that splits into two 3-carbon molecules. The second step is a sequence of reactions using electrons from NADPH and some of the ATP to reduce carbon dioxide. In the final step, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate is regenerated. For every three turns of the cycle, five molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are used to reform three molecules of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. The remaining glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is then used to make glucose, fatty acids, or glycerol. It takes two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to make one molecule of glucose phosphate. Thus, the Calvin cycle has to run six times to produce one molecule of glucose. These molecules can remove their phosphate and add fructose to form sucrose, the molecule plants use to transport carbohydrates throughout their system. Glucose phosphate is also the starting molecule for the synthesis of starch and cellulose. Plants produce sugars to use as storage molecules and structural components for their own benefit. By utilizing the energy of the sun, along with inputs of water and carbon dioxide, plants act as glucose factories. Photosynthetic organisms are the primary producers of glucose on the planet. They also produce oxygen gas as a byproduct and thus serve as the foundation of life, providing food and oxygen for the complex food webs on both land and in the oceans.